I'm John Entwistle, and welcome to Tape 1, Side 1. But basically what I'm going to try and do on this first tape is to give you some alternatives. Alternatives to slap and pop. Christ, I don't know about you, but I'm bored stiff with it. I mean, <laughs> if God had meant us to play like that all the time, he would have, or she, would have given us crab claws. Anyway, first I'm going to get you to experiment with different right hand techniques. I mean, without experimentation, the bass guitar would still be played in an upright position with a bow. Now, bass strings can be hit with anything to produce a note. Fingers, plectrums, drumsticks, nail files, mic stands, even things that can get you arrested for indecent exposure. Now, I really believe that the bass guitar can be as exciting, if not more, a lead instrument as guitar or synthesizer. Before I started work on this tape, I listened to an awful lot of other instruction courses, and I've got to tell you before we start, that this isn't going to be anything like them. And this tape also made me sit down for the first time and analyze exactly what makes me play the way I do. I mean, I'd heard complicated expressions like hammer-ons, pull-offs, double hammer-ons, double hammer-on, pull-offs, and thought, flaming hell, I wonder if I can do all that sort of stuff. But after I started doing this tape, I realized I've been doing it for 20 years. Now there's no way on this tape that I can teach you to play exactly like me. Uh, not if you want to anyway, one's enough. But uh, there are things I play and listen back to afterwards and think now, wow, how did I do that? There are also lines that I played on stage some nights that are one-offs and uh, will never be heard again. But that's the great thing about improvisation. I mean, how else can you cope with playing the same song for 18 years without ending up in the funny farm? All I can really do is give you a few tips and shortcuts and leave the rest to you and your own imagination. And remember, in every good bass guitarist, there has to be a little bit of a composer as well. And not only do you have to be technically brilliant, but you also have to make the bass parts up as you go along. Now, you can spend the rest of your life playing four beats to the bar, and playing the root notes and reading someone else's bass part on a sheet of music. Or you can try and take the bass a step further than its boring classical role and steal some of the glory from the guitarists, singers and keyboard players. Now hopefully you've already read and followed the instructions in the book that came with this tape. And if you haven't, turn this tape off and go and do it. Done it? Good. Okay, the first thing we've got to do is tune up. Now I'm tuned to A440 through an electronic tuning device, and if you haven't got one, you should have. So here's a G. Now D. Just joking. Here's the E. Okay. As I said before, there are dozens of ways of producing a note on bass. I'm going to stick to the right hand just for now and give you a few of the methods I use. Now, figure one in the book illustrates my, as best it can, normal hand position. Thumb resting on the E string, and fingers free for the A, D, and G string. This way the E string can either be played by the thumb, or the hand can be lifted and enable the other fingers to pluck it. I usually use all the fingers on my right hand, as I don't really like them to get jealous of each other. And my little finger gets used the least, but occasionally uh, gets used for G string pops like this. <laughs> The 
fingers I use the most are the first and second. I usually alternate them, uh, but with no real preference as to which one strikes the string first. So you should practice on each string, alternating your first and second fingers and trying to build up some speed. And also start with a different finger each time. Now, figure one in the book illustrates the normal hand position that I use for playing, but there is a variation on this position which isn't illustrated. Uh, now this position will enable you to play loud, forceful, uh, fast passages, um, but it'll be slightly different position for all of you, so um, that's why it's not illustrated. Now your thumb is still anchored on the E string, but the hand is arched more to give you more muscle tension in your forearm. Now this stiffening is, is needed to stiffen your fingers for force and speed at the same time. Although most of the time when you're playing, your forearm will rest on the body of the bass, when playing in this tensed position, it's necessary sometimes to lift your forearm away from the bass body, almost pointing your elbow at a right angle from the bass. And you push the string down and release it, uh, almost like popping it. <coughs> like that, pushing the finger towards the scratch plate. And when you play fast, it should sound something like this. Figure two, illustrated in the book, is the tapping method. Now with this, the hand is held with the fingers pointing up the neck, that is parallel to the neck, and supported by the thumb, and the tips of the fingers tap the strings against the fingerboard in the area of the last two frets at the end of the fingerboard. Uh, like a typewriter, really. Now, you can use all your fingers, uh, one for each string. Or even using two or three fingers in rapid succession on one string. also play chords by hitting two or three strings at once. succession in chords. Right, now what I was actually doing there was tapping out the chord. while the chord was still ringing underneath, superimposing the harmonics. And this kind of re-triggers the chord. Uh, you can go on forever. It's 
etc. Now there's nothing magic about harmonics. I mean they're right there on the fingerboard all the time, somewhere. Now the secret is learning and remembering where they are and then uh, managing to use them properly. For example, the strongest harmonic is just behind the fifth fret. Now this is an octave harmonic of the open string that you happen to be playing. This is a G, D, A, E. And there are several others as you move towards the nut at varying positions between the frets. Now the closer you go to the nut, the closer the harmonics are together. Like this. Now sometimes it's pretty difficult to actually gauge where they're going to be, but uh, you, you'll probably end up learning a few little fancy pieces, like sort of... just work up and down. Now you can trigger the harmonics either by playing the string with the right hand and gently touching the harmonic position, that is touching the string lightly for a split second before lifting your finger. Or you can leave out the left hand completely and tap the exact same harmonic positions with the right hand in the same way that we triggered the harmonics on the 15th, 17th and 19th frets. But that can be a little bit messy. Now using the tapping method you can also combine real notes with the harmonics. Try this and play an open D its octave on the seventh fret of the G string. Now you leave it ringing and tap the harmonics up and down the G string. Now you can soon work out where all the harmonics are by just messing around and experimenting. Also by tapping the right hand on say the 17th or the 19th fret um, while playing different notes with the left hand, uh, you can obtain a few different force harmonics. That was on the 19th, there you go to the 17th. Or the 15th. Or use a combination. You'll find there's almost endless combinations using different methods of obtaining harmonics, but I'm not going to fry my brain or yours by showing you all of them, so I think that's enough harmonics for now. Okay, finally, before we leave the tapping method, um, this is everything we talked about so far in tapping, the harmonics, uh, chords and single notes. Uh, combined into one song, which uh, you might recognize, some of you.
figure three illustrates the pulling method. This is a much slower method of playing, but it's particularly useful if you want a phrase to pop out in a song because it's loud. The fingers are hooked under the strings and pulled upwards and popped, like this. Again, you can use all your fingers simultaneously so that you can play chords. Now, we can take this method a stage further because we haven't used our thumb yet. Hook your thumb under the open A string. Hook your first finger under the G string with your left hand fretting the second fret of the G string, which is the A octave. Now play them at the same time, like this. This is one of the only methods of playing octaves that I know of. You can also use the tapping method. We'll be getting into octaves in more detail a little later. Now, from now on to save time, uh, I'm going to refer to this thumb and first finger technique on octaves as crab claws. Now, crab claws can be used on adjacent strings as well, for example, on the D and G string. Figure four in the book illustrates the flicking method, or as I call it, the effing method. Now, everybody at some time in their life has flicked something with their thumb and first finger. It could be a marble, piece of paper, something you just removed from your nose. What happens is your thumb holds back your first finger like a spring and then releases it. Now, doing this to a chord or a single note is a pretty good substitute for a plectrum if you happen to be playing with your fingers at the time. All you're really doing is using your first finger now to produce a harder note. Now, it's pretty useful to end a phrase or a song. You can also take this method one stage further. If you place your left hand first finger on the seventh fret of the D string and your little finger on the ninth fret of the G string in the fifth chord with your right thumb resting on the E string in the normal playing position you play an open A with your first finger bringing it back to meet your thumb then flick or wipe your first finger across the A, D and G strings like this. And this can be used in several other ways, for example. One little warning, this method should never be used to excess. I did at one concert and I used it so much that I found afterwards that the strings had worn a hole through the center of my nail and it was pretty painful until it grew out. Okay, now let's talk about exercising your right hand. Uh, there are various methods for this, but uh, let's take some other examples. Now, loosening up your right hand is really important if you want to play fast. I mean, one easy way is to become a, a finger drummer. I mean, it irritates your friends like hell, but it does help get your fingers moving. I'm a, I'm a subconscious finger drummer all the time. I get this drum rhythm in my head and my right foot starts tapping out the bass pattern and my right hand taps away at an imaginary bass and people may think you're a nervous nut, but they, uh, they don't when they hear you play eventually. 
Also, if you've got a piano or a keyboard, um, five finger exercises are, are useful. You know, playing C, D, E, F, G, F, E, D, C up and down from your thumb to your little finger and back again with both hands. And also trills uh, like C, D, C, D, C, D, C, D uh, with the first and second fingers and all the other finger combinations are also excellent ways to strengthen your fingers and hands. Okay, now, here are some right hand exercises on bass to help build up speed. It's really up to you what you do with your left hand while you're doing these, but uh, although playing them down the neck where the frets are wider apart will be more beneficial to your left hand. And also, try to use as many different finger combinations as you can and on different strings. And try to use all the right hand methods we talked about so far. Okay. Side one's finished. You can turn me over now. Okay, try and play along.
something completely different. Um, an important part of my playing style is building up rhythm patterns using left hand damping. That is, producing dead notes by lifting the left hand, still touching the strings, but not fretting it. For example, Magic Bus by The Who. Uh, a boring single monotone passage like this can take on a new feel when you introduce dead note patterns like this. You try to imagine a drum pattern. The dead notes of the top kit and snare and the fretted notes are your bass line and the bass drum combined. Like this. Playing with the plectrum or a pick. For quite a few years, I thought that playing bass with a pick was a cop-out. What I mean by that is I felt, for me, it was a step backwards from the way I play with my fingers. Now I realize how stupid that was, because I was leaving out a whole different set of sounds and effects from my playing style. Now there are things you can play with your fingers that you can't play with a pick. And there are also cases in the opposite direction. Playing with a pick is louder, are more cutting, although you lose some of that warm bottom that you get from your fingers. Hmm, I could have phrased that better, I think. It's also a lot tidier, especially in fast rhythmic passages. In some situations, it's also much, much faster. Now, this is pretty much my top speed playing this figure with my fingers. <laughs> But now listen when I play the same figure with a pick. Slightly faster. Now the tip of the pick doesn't have to move as far as the tip of your finger, so it's ready to play the next note a lot quicker. There are a few basic rules to remember about playing with a pick. Number one, downstrokes are stronger than upstrokes. I usually only use upstrokes if the phrase is too fast to play in just downstrokes. Two, don't 
use tortoiseshell picks. They're very pretty and purest, but not very practical when you're using wire wound strings. Uh, they wear away in next to no time, they crack, and pretty soon it feels like you're playing with a nail file. Three, don't use light or medium gauge picks. Playing bass with these is kind of like uh, playing tennis with a fly swap. I always use Herco heavies or something similar. Any heavy nylon pick will do, although uh, it must be slightly pliable or it may slow down your playing with the thickness. And lastly, some kind of serrated finger grip uh, is useful so that you have a firmer grip on it when the damn thing's bouncing all over the strings. So now I'll, I'll talk you through a few pick exercises. Now these are all on one string, although uh, when you practice you should use all four strings. Now the extra hiss that you keep on hearing is me turning the amplifier on and off. Okay, the exercises. Now first uh, is all downstrokes. I'll play them on the A. that with uh, with the palm of my hand pushed down on the strings uh, to prevent it ringing so much uh, now we're going to uh, we're going to damping a little bit later but uh, if I played it open it would sound like this <laughs> which is a little bit noisier okay now something a little faster, uh, alternating up and down strokes, starting with the down and then an up. Okay? Now triplets. Down, and then up, and then down. Now, a triplet combination. Down, then down, up, down, up, down, up. Down, up, down, up, down. is down and up as fast as you can. Pretty useful for the ends of songs. Uh, I think the Who actually used it every time they ended a song. Oh, I used it in the Who. Anyway, here it is. Now, always start a phrase with a downstroke. Um, it creates a much bigger impact, and also it's a much stronger way of starting a phrase. Okay, now, here are a few more exercises, and I'll leave it to you to work out the up and the downstrokes for yourself.
the most well-known part I've ever played with a pick is the solo from the Who's My Generation. Now that solo was hung around my neck like an albatross for nearly 20 years. So I figured that if I teach as many people as I can to play it, I won't have to play it anymore. So here it is. Now I'll talk you through it really slow. Okay, now the first solo. This one is all downstrokes with the pick, except for one note. And hopefully I'll tell you when that one's coming up. So starting with the little finger on the fifth fret of the D string, then the first finger on the third fret of the G, little finger on the fifth fret of the G, still with the little finger slide up to the seventh fret of the G, still with the little finger back to the fifth fret of the G, first finger third fret of the G, little finger fifth fret of the D, first finger third fret of the G, little finger fifth fret of the D, now here comes the upstroke, first finger third fret of the D string, little finger fifth fret of the A, first finger third fret of the D, little finger fifth fret of the A, and that's it, now a little faster. And this is up to speed. Okay, got that. <laughs> now, the second solo. This is an easy one. All downstrokes. Starting with the little finger, alternating with the first finger. I'm going to start with the little finger, fifth fret of the D string. Now the first finger, third fret of the D string. 5th fret of the A string, 3rd fret of the A string, I bend up with your little finger on the 5th fret of the E, now 1st finger, 3rd fret of the E, little finger, 5th fret of the A, 3rd fret of the D, 2nd finger, 4th fret of the D string, Okay, I'll play that real slow. A little faster. Now, up to speed. Right, the third solo. Now, this is the hard one. Three upstrokes in this one. It starts like the first solo. Little finger, fifth fret of the D string. Then the first finger, third fret of the G. Little finger on the fifth fret of the G. Slide up with the little finger to the seventh fret of the G. Still with the little finger, back to the fifth fret of the G. Now, up stroke, first finger, third fret. Now, little finger, fifth fret of the D string. First finger, third fret of the G. Little finger, fifth fret of the D. Upstroke, first finger, the third fret of the D string. Little finger, fifth fret of the A. First finger, third fret of the D. Little finger, fifth fret of the A. First finger, third fret of the A. Little finger, fifth fret of the E, bending up and release. Whoa. Well, I hope you understood that, but at least you can play it back about 300 times to uh, work it out. Okay, now, playing that slowly, it sounds like this. <laughs> or up to speed, if I can. Right, the last solo. Now, little finger on the fifth fret of the D string. Now, this is all on the one string there. It's 
a down, down, up, down stroke on the same string. Okay? Ending with a down stroke. Now you put the first finger on the third fret of the D string and you start with the up stroke, which is up, down, up, down. Now the first finger, third fret of the A string, you play that three times. And then on the third time you hammer on the little finger onto the fifth fret. And the last note is the first finger on the third fret of the D string. So I'll play it slowly. And up to speed. See, even I make a muff up sometimes. So, now when you put it all together with the G, 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 F, 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 Fs in between, it should sound like this. Only just to satisfy myself that I could, I just played it with my fingers. Now, dissecting a solo like that, even down to the fingers that I use, uh, actually shows you a lot about the way I played then, and to a certain extent I still do. And you'll notice that most of the time I only use my first and little fingers of my left hand, and most of the solos were around the third, fifth and seventh frets of the guitar. But dissecting and analysing your playing in this way can show you a lot about yourself and the way you play. And also show you what not to play to get out of any kind of rut that you might feel that you're stuck in. So okay, now let's go on to right hand damping. Now you dampen the strings by pushing the fleshy edge of your palm down onto the bridge saddles, producing a note like this. You can also form rhythm patterns by taking the palm off and putting it back on, like this. Thinking in the same drum kit way as the dead notes with the left hand, you lift the palm up for top kit and snare, and palm down for bass drum, or the other way around if you prefer, like this. After a bit of practice and experimentation, you can combine the two different damping techniques and play things like this. This is the end of side two, tape one. Please eject me. Although I don't believe in reading bass parts, uh, and you're only as good as the part that's been written, and it might as well have been played by someone else anyway, uh, you must know where the different notes are on the fingerboard, especially as far as octaves are concerned. For example, the octave of your low open E is obviously on the 12th fret of your E string, as this is the corresponding octaves of the A, D, G open strings, the 12th fret being the octave fret. But this is often the deadest 
sounding octave position because of the short length of string that, that is left to vibrate. But that same E octave is also on the seventh fret of the A string. And this note not only sounds better, but can be played at the same time as your low open E. The same E octave is also available on the second fret of the D string. It can be played at the same time using the crab claw method. I only use the 12th fret octave, that is the octave on the same string, if I'm about to play a high figure traveling across the fingerboard from it, or to slow up from the open E. The next, even higher E octave is available on the 19th fret of the A string also the 14th fret of the D string and the 9th fret of the G string. These last two can both be combined with their lower mid octaves. For example, using crab claws again, you can play the 7th fret of the A string and the 9th fret of the G string. Well, depending on the phrase you're playing and the area of the fingerboard it's in, the 12th fret of the E string and the 14th fret of the D string. But remember what I said about the length of string left to vibrate. The same octaves on the A and G string sound much better. Okay, now the bass I'm using is a precision bass, uh, which only goes as high as E flat, which isn't much use in the key of E, but uh, two octave neck basses will have an even higher E on the 21st fret of the G string, and an extra two positions of of the octave lower on the 24th fret of the E and the 19th fret of the A. I've used the octaves of E for an example because the key of E is probably the nicest key for bass because the lowest note on the instrument is used and the fingerboard positions are very easy to play. Now you can use the fingerboard chart in the book to work out all your other octave positions and you'll notice there are very obvious octave patterns that emerge. For example, apart from open string octaves where the next octave up is either on the adjacent string, 7th fret, or two strings away, 2nd fret, all the other octave positions are the same shape. For example, low G and its higher octave, C and its higher octave, middle E and its higher octave. Now when I play I find myself using this octave position all the time, in fact I always hold my left hand in a position ready to play the higher octave if I need it. For example In fact I often use crab claws to play octave melodies. fingers or plectrum to play octave syncopated patterns. And one other great advantage in this shape is by bridging the string in between with your little finger, you automatically get a fifth chord. A one way of playing fast passages is the use of hammer-ons. I mean, I always called them slurs, but the correct term as far as modern guitar playing is concerned is apparently hammer-ons. Uh, sounds a bit like hemorrhoids, but anyway, this is a technique of picking the first note and just fretting the second. For example, with your first finger on the fifth fret of the D string, play a note with your right hand now hammer your little finger down on the 7th fret. See? You've done it before, haven't you? Now, do the same on the same fret positions on the G string. Now do the same two things, but one after the other. Now 
Now, if all the notes were fingered off plucks, it would sound like this. But obviously, if you don't have to worry about fingering everything with the right hand, you can play much faster. Now, try playing an open A, followed by the previous exercise that we've just done. It should sound like this. Now here's a passage using the hammer-on technique combined with left-hand dead notes. You can also use hammer-ons to play triplets by playing two notes and hammering on the third. And with a bit of practice to build up speed, you'll be able to play things like this. Suppose you've just played a note on the fifth fret of the G string, this one, and then hammered on to the seventh with your little finger, and then suddenly you get this unbelievable itch on your nose that you've just got a scratch with your right hand. Now by pulling and plucking the string with your little finger and hammering it back on again and then repeating the action continuously, you can play an everlasting trill and keep it going till the itch is dealt with. Now, left hand pull-offs are mostly used for this kind of flashy, trilly one hand playing and are nowhere near as useful as hammer-ons. Now, string bending. Well, you'll never be able to emulate Clapton or Hendrix uh, on a bass guitar when you're pushing around wire around bass strings. It can be extremely painful, especially when your finger gets stuck under the string. Uh, but once you learn the limitations of bass string bending, it can be lots of fun. Now, the closer the string gets towards the nut, the harder it is to bend. It's, the string is tighter. Uh, but the strings get looser the closer you get to the end of the fingerboard. Uh, say, for example, you wanted to bend your low E string up to an A from the third fret. You can just about make it. Uh, about, you know, a tone and a half, maybe two tones at a stretch. Um, uh, other nice string bending things are wobbles right? that's bending and releasing bending and releasing uh, very nice on the E string get a bit of fret rattle occasionally now the E and the A string are mostly bent in a downwards position Whereas the D and the G string, you bend in an upwards motion. Otherwise, you run over the end of the fingerboard. But if, for example, you're playing a blues sequence in A, you can get some nice bends in on the 5th and 7th fret of the G string, also on the 3rd fret of the A string, like this. Thank you. 
Now, drummers. The drummer in the band is most often the member of the band that we have to work the most closely with. And most of the time we're the two members of the band that have a natural affinity to each other. We are, after all, the most important part of the band, the rhythm section. If you're a bass player, that's a bit silly of saying that, isn't it? If you're a bass player, you should start <laughs> You should study drumming very closely as the drum part directly affects your bass part and vice versa. And consequently, uh, we're only as good as our drummer allows us to be, and vice versa. Now, whenever I practice bass, I play along with a drum machine, my trusty old Lin Mark II. It's probably spent more time playing with me than any real drummer has. The irritating thing about them is they never make any mistakes unless you program them to. And I never bleed and stop when you do either. I also have a couple of drum kits that I play on, um, although the blisters from the sticks tend to keep me away most of the time. Still, I think that some kind of drum machine is really important, both for practicing with and to help work out drum rhythms, which in turn will help your ability to invent bass patterns. Um, for example, you know, just doodle around with a drum machine, changing rhythms, and uh, see what happens. just me messing about but uh, it illustrates what I mean about helping work out bass patterns and drum rhythms. Now this next example with drums is a shuffle meaning the time signature is the dreaded 6-8. Now 6-8 is just 4-4 four, four in triplets. I mean there are two bars of 6-8 to one bar of 4-4. Four, four. Therefore it's easy to change backwards and forwards from one to the other. Now I'll start by counting with the bass from 6-8, uh, then into 4-4, four, four, and then back again. Now I'll attempt to play something that changes.
Whew. I played that to try to show you that sometimes nice things happen when the bass guitarist cuts across the drum patterns. But that's enough drums. Now, we've covered basic left hand hammer-ons and pull-offs, but what about right hand hammer-ons? And remember the tapping technique that we covered earlier? Well, the fingers are used in the same way only the fingers of the right hand are hammered on to the actual notes you want to produce. For example... Now the right hand hammer-ons go hand in hand with right hand pull-offs. I mean, all that means is after you've hammered on the finger, you hold it there, and instead of lifting it off, uh, you pluck the string by moving the finger downwards. Now try this, with the first finger of the right hand, touch the 12th fret of the G string. Hold it there, and then pluck it. And just push your finger away from the fingerboard. Now it will play a G, an octave below. Now do the same only on the 15th fret of the G string. Now again, on the 17th fret of the G string. Now, play all three, one after another. You'll notice that every time you pull off, the low G is played. Now this opens up another set of possibilities. What if you use your left hand as well? Try playing the same frets with your right hand, but put your left hand first finger on the fifth fret of the G string. So now we know that our right hand hammer-ons produce the notes they're pushed onto, but the right hand pull-offs produce notes controlled by the position of the left hand on the fingerboard. You can also play more than one note at a time, forming chords with both hands. So, once you've got a little bit more adept at playing left and right hand hammer-ons and pull-offs, you'll realise that the two can be combined to produce flashy little phrases such as this. completely useless and no use to anyone. So, let's talk about amplifiers for a while. On stage, I use huge powerful stacks of amps and cabinets. I go through various preamps into four Sun Coliseum power amps and through 16 12 inch speakers and four 18 inch speakers and the PA system. Now in a studio situation, there's no way you can use that kind of setup. It would be impossible to record you need a smaller, lower powered setup, or use a suitable preamp direct into a desk, as I have on this tape. An overdrive will allow you to get your sound at a much lower volume level, or you can use a smaller amp, which will distort and sustain at a lower volume. Unfortunately, uh, I've never been able to achieve my sound with my guitar plugged direct into the desk without using a preamp. Now the terrifying thing about touring is coming back from playing to 70,000 people in LA to 3,500 people in Hammersmith Odeon. Uh, it's kind of like uh, playing in a biscuit tin sometimes. Now, there's no way you can use the exact same amps and cabinets. I've tried and tried and failed and failed. The secret, the answer, is a modular variable amp setup. If you use preamps, two mono or one stereo with some kind of overdrive, you don't have to rely on sheer volume and power to get your sound. And you can vary the amount of amps and cabinets that you use to suit the hall that you're playing in. Also, you use the same preamp in the studio. You can either direct it into the desk 
or I use smaller power amps and speaker cabinets and mic them. Uh, for example, 250 watt power amps into two separate 12 inch speakers. As for effects, there are so many around now it's difficult to decide which ones to buy. And it's also difficult to work out which ones are actually going to get used or just be an expensive toy that sits unplugged on a shelf forever. Or in the case of foot pedals, in a box till the battery leaks. I must admit, I prefer rack mounted units to floor pedals. They're usually more expensive, but they're also more comprehensive. And unlike foot pedal effects, they can't be readjusted for you by the front row of the audience. A good chorus and flanger, stereographic equalizer, and digital delay are the most important effects units to have. I've used quite a lot of the built-in reverb and chorus in the preamp on this tape, as you can probably hear. But my favourite effect is my digital delay. Hours of fun playing duets with a chip. side on.
Wow! That key saw on the left was nearly as good as me! Still, I must admit, I never use effects on stage. Yet. They're just something else to go wrong and get me into trouble. I just use the different EQ effects on my alembic bass. So, now what is so different about the electronics on an alembic bass? Well, I'll show you. I'll play some notes on this Fender Precision bass and turn the tone control clockwise and show you the tone range. Yeah, a good bassy sound at one end and a good treble sound at the other end, but not too much happens in between. Well, now I've changed to an alembic bass. It's stereo, but I've wired it into the preamp in mono. Now, as well as having a volume and tone control for each of its two pickups, it has a three position switch for each pickup. Now, these are used to vary the amount that the two notch filters are affecting the tone controls. Now, the up position of the switches is an off position and the tone control operates as a standard tone control. And in the center position, the tone control was more of a frequency sweep. Now in a downward position, the notch filter is more pronounced, giving almost a wah-wah effect. If you play with your left hand only and use your right hand on the tone controls, you can get sounds almost like a synthesizer. <laughs> Now, as you turn the tone control clockwise and anti-clockwise, you can hear the frequencies getting higher and lower. Now, I'll stop at a few of these frequencies and show you some of the range of the sounds you can get by setting the control in different positions. It's almost like choosing a frequency to dominate the sound with.
Ah, that reminds me of what I want to talk about next. That's my favourite subject. Whoops! Now, there are several species of whoop. There's the great whoop. There's the lesser whoop. There's the double whoop. That was up and down. The triple whoop. The quadruple whoop. And that goes up too. Now, they're pretty difficult ones, those multiple whoops. They're, uh, it's just a matter of swapping strings uh, part way through the whoop. You start sliding up on the E, then take over with the A, then the D. There's also the wipeout whoop, the ricochet whoop, the right hand hammer on whoop. Oh, sorry, that was the uh, hammer on walk whoop, or walking whoop as it's known. Uh, this is a hammer on whoop. Not very impressive. I much prefer the greater whoop. Or a lower one. There are various other lesser known species such as the chord whoops. Final whoop word. Now they're great attention getters from an audience point of view, and they help to break the monotony. But they also help to break your skin. I like string bending. Make sure that you have thick calluses before you get thick blisters. And one other thing: whoops on tape wound strings are finger suicide. Because the strings are so smooth, they cause much more friction on the fingers, and it's instant blister time. Now when we first started as a band, our equipment was pretty lousy. About as good as the band, actually, but it was all we could afford, or maybe more than we could afford. But we were road managing ourselves in those days, and the rest of the band actually refused to carry my 18-inch speaker cabinet because it was too heavy. So the speaker was taken out and carried separately, and then hung on a 6-inch nail in the cabinet just before we played. Consequently, every time I played a low E, it would vibrate off the nail and fall out of the cabinet and have to be picked up and hung back up again. Also, our drummer's snare drum was so quiet and so thin that we could never hear it. So I started slapping my bass strings to strengthen the offbeat a bit. It worked pretty well and eventually became almost second nature and as time passed the slap patterns became more adventurous and more complicated so that even after our drummer bought a new loud snare drum I just carried on slapping as usual so just in case you have a drummer with a snare drum you can't hear I'll show you a few slap patterns now you don't slap with the whole of your hand you slap with your little finger and your third finger of the right hand at a kind of uh, 45 degrees to the string and that leaves your fingers, your first and second fingers and your thumb free to play the notes in between the slaps. So now we'll start with something simple and then get a little bit more complicated later on. Okay, let's go.
dealing with four string basses so far but uh, let's talk about five string, six string and eight string basses. Now these are all attempts to extend the range of the bass guitar. In the case of the five string bass, the fifth string can either be a high C string or a low B string below your low E. And no one has yet made a low B string which works. So I use a high C, which is more used to me anyway. Now the C gives you a much higher range, especially on a two octave neck alembic five string. And the main advantage over the four string bass is the ability to play riffs straight across the frets instead of having to move up the neck to play the high notes. But the main disadvantage is that the strings are much closer together to keep the width of the neck down and consequently it's easier to play with a pick than your fingers. However, you can play some nice things on it. So, the sound of the five string bass really depends on the balance of the strings. On a four string bass, the G string is a bit alien to the others, it just doesn't sound like them. And in the case of the high C on a five string, it makes matters even worse. You really have a three string bass and a two string guitar. Now, I'm still working on the strings for mine, but until they come together, the five string has still got some nice things going for it. Now, the problem of strings being close together is even more so on a six string bass. Consequently, they're suited more to a lead guitarist. And also the fact that no one has yet made a long scale six string bass leads me straight on to the eight string bass. Well, the eight string bass I think it's better if I let it speak for itself.
But beware, don't let your playing style get too dependent on technical wizardry. Remember, people, the public, like to hear melodies, and the bass guitarist's fundamental purpose is to drive the band along. So make sure you're fulfilling that purpose first, and the flashy bits can be stuck in whenever the opportunity arises. You just have to learn when to lay back and when to take over. I mean, I never did. Uh, but don't forget, there's only one way to play fast, and that is to keep playing, practicing, and experimenting. And above all, just use your imagination. It's no use being able to play fast if you ain't got nothing to play. Well, that's it for the time being. If anyone has any questions, they can write to me care of the hot licks people, and I'll try and answer in some way. Uh, maybe on yet another tape. I don't know yet. I'm going to leave you with a sequence I came up with while I was doodling around with right-hand hammer-ons. It might turn into a song someday. Anyway, here it is. See ya, and remember, let's be loud out there. Thank you.